everybody. Welcome back to Board Game Breakfast Live. 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 My name is Z Garcia. I'm Sam Healy. Welcome back. Uh, all right, so we've got a whole lot of segments for you today. Hopefully, you've got your breakfast ready. Yeah. Sam has his cup of uh, cup of coffee over there. Cup of Joe, yeah. Cup of Joe, he's good to go. And so, uh, as you can see, Mr. Tom Vassell will not be joining us today. So we are going to have to cut at least one segment. You're not going to see ten for ten. Of course, I will not be doing. But <laughs> you this should is like be... the one time I was guaranteed to win. You won like the last two. But you're right that you would have definitely I would have won definitely it. won this. I would have played against you though, and seeing as to how I know all the answers, lost. Yeah, you're, you're, it's it's better this way. Okay, <laughs> I'm good with it. In any case, again, thanks for joining us, and we're gonna yes. go ahead and take a look at some news right now. Let's hit it. <laughs> All right, so here we go. We got a few things to talk about today, starting off with Fast Sloths, an upcoming game from Freakman Freeze and Stronghold Games. And in this game, uh, it's a racing game, and it, it, the players are going to be drafting different cards and playing them to move different animals and move themselves around the board, which you can see right here, of course, in prototype form. Uh, the idea is you're always going to play six out of 12 different animal species and uh, you are going to organize that big board in four different configurations so that it is modular oh, okay. and the everything is going to spring forth from the interaction between the different animals. So like a big elephant can take you with its trunk and throw you, you, would, you yourself are a sloth moving around the board but you don't want to move yourself. You want all the other animals to do the moving for so you. So you're not actually a fast sloth. You're moving around quickly. You're a sloth that's being chucked around by you're everybody You're an extra else. lazy sloth. Yes. But there's no Fs in that. So that won't work for <laughs> Mr. Friedman Freaks. <laughs> and so, yeah, you can be thrown by an elephant. You can be carried along by ants along the floor uh, on a different, you know, on a chain of uh, ants, things like that. Again, coming out from Stronghold Games, I know that a, a prototype was floating around at a recent convention we were at. And so stay tuned for that. It makes me think of Fast Flowing Forest Fellers, which is a previous racing game from him. Uh, yes. That was a card-driven one with just numbers on the cards right. to move you along. But the board definitely looks like that. Well, uh, uh, Jose Guerrero says that sloths swim faster than they move on land. Is that right? Yeah. I also saw a whole thread that talked about how somebody was going on and on about how the sloth in the image here has four digits, and they normally should have only two or three. I guess depending on the type of sloth, I don't know. But, uh, you know. Wow. That's important stuff, man. These are the things we need to discuss in Board Game Breakfast. Stay tuned for the hard news. Next up, Jeff Anime Game has partnered into entered into a distribution uh, partnership with Discami Publishing Company, uh, which is based in Canada. And this is going to cover games based around the Sailor, uh, Sailor Moon uh, IP, in this case Sailor Moon Crystal, which I guess is an offshoot of Sailor Moon originally. They already have two games that are being worked on and already have release dates or at least release windows for later in 2019 with additional games being developed for 2020. Um, uh, they have one which is a season three expansion for Sailor Moon Dice Challenge and Sailor Moon Crystal Truth or Bluff, a tile passing game with elements of deception and misdirection. And that's gonna be again released later this year. So hmm. there you go. Beepy skippy. We've got here an expansion coming out to a game that I don't think a whole lot of people know came out. This is Batman the Animated Series game from IDW. Well, they've got an expansion coming out now, Masterminds and Mayhem. And uh, the first time the enemies, of course, were defeated, but now we've got new Arkham Asylum residents coming to the forefront in this Masterminds and Mayhem expansion. Uh, both the original base game that, again, is out, and this expansion coming out later are designed by Michael Giuliano and Richard Launius. Uh, you okay. should know very well at least one of those names, of course, the designer of Arkham Horror and many other games. Yeah. Uh, in the game, uh, it's one through five players, and the players are going to take on the role of Batman and the rest of the, you know, Bat family, if you would, to thwart the plans of the masterminds who Bat have family. deadlier weapons and improved tactics in the expansion. 
Uh, got armored cards and explosives. The villains are now also going to be hiring goons on the streets to fight Batman and his team directly. Um, there's also a new mechanism called uh, new rooftop villains and act leader target mechanisms uh, that have been added. And of course, the mastermind cards are going to include the Joker, Two Face, the Riddler, and so on. This is a 45 to 60 minute game. It's aimed at ages 14 and up, and it should be coming out in October 2019. Next up, Tragic Events Expansion Pack from Indie Boards and Cards for Flashpoint Fire Rescue. And again, this is coming out later on, uh, or at least it'll be kickstarted. Um, no, it's coming out later on this year. It was kickstarted in 2017. And it should be expected to release in July 2019 here. The main thing this adds, which I found pretty interesting, is it has uh, these flare-up cards that replace the original way in which the game spread fire on the board. Oh, okay. So, you know, the, the hot spots and, and fire spread was all dice-driven, basically. And now this is going to include a new deck of cards that takes that system over. Okay. That's, that sounds like a real change to the yeah, core game, you know, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, but yeah, the idea is at the beginning of the game, a fire deck is created with fire rage and accelerate cards, along with a pool of flare up cards uh, that are set by the board. And then during each of those advanced fire phases, uh, one is drawn and resolved. Uh, flare up cards are added to the fire deck when the accelerate card is drawn and it causes an event to occur. Sounds a little bit like a pandemic style idea with a card that then sort of, you know, pushes the, the bad events to a breaking point. Okay. So there you go. Flashpoint, of course, being a cooperative game to one to, from one to six players in which everyone is going to be firefighters. And this gives you new firefighters as well. New characters, which you can see right here. The 28 fire cards, three specialists, the events, and new miniatures for your new firefighters. So there you go. Cool. Next up, Volcanic Isle, coming out from Arcane Wonders. is a two to four player game in which the players are going to be build, building villages and raising the Moai, the statues from Easter Island. That's a cool cover. Uh, that is a cool cover. I like that one of them seems to be sinking into uh, the uh, volcanic fault there. Mm -hmm. And um, this is from a couple of designers, and Andrea Mainini, who is known for designing Sails of Glory, and Luciano Zoprazetti. Zopranzetti. Mm -hmm. There we go. So the players are striving basically to build the most uh, thriving settlement despite the chaos of volcanic activity and the constantly changing landscape. Here we take a look at the board and some of the components. Looks neat. There looks to be sort of a connection mechanism there from what I can see. But it, what's intriguing me the most is this idea of a changing landscape. It looks yeah. like you are adding volcano tiles these look like little volcano tiles that you are adding to the board where new volcanoes are springing up. Yeah. So that's pretty neat. That is cool. It's a, it's a good looking game. A uh, few components, you know, a few moving parts, but it seems... What's with the bullets over there? I don't know. I think those are roads is what I assumed oh. that they went between these places. The one thing that looks weird is the little people, for some reason to me, look like Star Trek characters or something. I don't know why. They're so far away. These little... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what it is about them that makes me think Star Trek, but... Yeah, yeah, no. All right, next up, we've got some news from Steve Jackson Games. Uh, they had a... Uh, uh, a, stoke, uh, a, a stockholders report recently. Wow. Uh, the, the, the right up here on my screen says stakeholder, as in a nice juicy piece of steak. <laughs> That made my brain go, mm -mm, I don't like, say that. I would like to be a stakeholder. Mm. Stakeholders meeting. That's a yes. good meeting. You have, to, you have to eat your steak with your hands. Correct. That's yes. good. That would be wonderful. You can have your steak and eat it, too. Exactly. Anyway, um, the house that Munchkin built here is a company that, as uh, it says in my notes, they, they operate on a lot of transparency, so they went ahead and released a lot of numbers recently. The... Uh, their success uh, this year was a smidge lower than 2017 when they put out some numbers as well. But they have had a successful year. They had Kickstarter games that were successful, like the Fantasy Trip. And, of course, they are continuing to expand the Munchkin universe. 
Uh, it says here the low point was the ill-fated Munchkin collectible card game, which struggled to find an audience despite good designers and mechanisms. <coughs> and again, this is all from them and their report that they published. Cool. Next up, we've got Charterstone Digital Edition coming out soon from Stonemeyer Games, or at least they're licensing the uh, IP. The mm. people actually making the video game is Acrum Digital, and they are known for doing quite a few other impressive translations of games into a digital medium, and that is Istanbul, Steam, Rails to Riches, and they did 8-Minute Empire. Uh, Charterstone is expected to come out in early 2020, 2020, and you can check out the website for Akram's, uh, Akram Digital for more information you, on that. What do you think about that? It seems like more and more board games are being made into digital platforms. Mm -hmm. I think it's fine. It's interesting. This one is interesting or more interesting than a lot of other ones because it is a legacy game. It'll change. So your, your digital uh, copy will be different than mine. Right, so I'm guessing as you are unlocking things in the game, your programming, the app, will save your progress, and mm -hmm. so you'll play through a campaign, as yeah. you would with the board game. Right. So that's different. I like that, that that's a little bit uh, outside what we're used to. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got here some news from the publishing arm of Asmodee. Um, Aconite is going to be... Publishing works of fiction based on the many fantastic worlds from Asmodee. Huh. We don't have a whole lot of details quite yet, but uh, like books and stuff like that. That's novels? right. Yeah, that's right. So they've got you know things in the works like Catan, Ticket to Ride, Pandemic, Arkham Horror, Keyforge, Dead of Winter, Legend of the Five Rings. Uh, all of these things are in their uh, in their wheelhouse now, and they've stated that they are aiming for a monthly publication schedule starting in summer 2020. I mean, are they talking like straight up like novels or graphic novels or what are I they talking? I don't think we know yet. Oh, okay. uh, They are basically saying that they are just, that's that's what I've got. They're publishing works of fiction based on these worlds. Huh. But, but then they're taking a look at a monthly pu publication schedule, so I'm not sure if these are going to be graphic novels, if we're talking comic book. Uh, interpretations of these worlds mm. i'm not sure but i would i would imagine that like uh novel forms would be kind of hard to that would be really hard to break into you'd have to have really good authors right um probably even well-known already authors mm -hmm. writing these stories in order to get that off the ground well and they can't really do it on a monthly schedule you know yeah, so I'm yeah. not, i assume this is short form fiction uh, likely with accompanying artwork, like a comic book. <laughs> Pandemic, a diseased romance novella. That would be good. I'd read it. <laughs> I don't think I would. <laughs> it doesn't. No, it doesn't really sound. They came up with the. They came up with a zombie version of Romeo and Juliet a while back. I can't remember what it was called, but I remember it was released on Valentine's Day. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah. It's uh, one guy was. Um, oh, I can't remember the. I can't remember the plot. I mean, the plot line in the background was, of course, Romeo and Juliet. But I can't remember how they switched it up. Well, it's kind of like those Abraham Lincoln vampire hunters yeah, and all those, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pride yeah. and Prejudice and Zombies. <laughs> Splendor novel. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> Collect those, you know, the epic action scenes as you race around town collecting gems. Mm -hmm. All right, next up, we've got some Arkham Horror the Card Game news here. Um, we've got another upcoming... Um, one of these return to packs in which they take a, a an arc, a story that has already happened in the world of the game, and they revisit that with new cards, with new possible plot points, and allow you to play through that arc again, it's usually with some added difficulty, but also just new content, more content, more cards. And this is the latest one. Return to the Path to Carcosa, which was the... Uh, I want to say the second standalone arc to the game. So they came out with one of these for the very first one that came included in the core box. Then they came out with one for the first arc, and this is now on the horizon as well. Uh, as it says here, your uh, search took you your search for answers took you across the sea to the shining lights of Paris and beyond to dim Carcosa, uh, and so now you are going to come back for an encore performance 
They are announcing this is coming out and it's now available for pre-order at your local retailer online, of course. Hmm. And uh, they have uh, new updated cards that the game will use against you as well as cards that you can use against the game. So this is like a second edition of an expansion that they've already put out? This is basically, uh, since it's so story driven, yeah. this is basically a kind of a what if scenario. Okay. You know, so they go, okay, well, you played this one scenario where you went to a mansion, found this crazy guy, and stole his keys and stole this artifact. Now, you when you stop, show up, you need to stop stealing so much stuff. You stole and stole and stole. <laughs> now, now you get to kill, kill, When kill. you show up, <laughs> that guy is not alone. That's right. He called him back up. Right. He keeps stealing Or like, stuff. you know, when you take his keys and go up one floor to open into a room, now it's no longer a choice of two doors. Now there's six doors. That and, kind of thing. And each of them has a baddie behind it. Several. <laughs> Expect this to hit shelves uh, <laughs> third quarter 2019. And here is some illustrations of what you can usually find in these boxes. Now, these boxes are definitely oversized for the content that comes in there. Yeah. But they intend for you to store the entire cycle in the box. And they are sturdy, they're well made, and you can keep it all in there. It even includes dividers uh, you mean, for that story. You mean the original story arc of that expansion mm -hmm. plus the second one That's right. in one box. Yeah. Got it. Because there's really not that many components in these. It's just a handful of cards, just a few mm -hmm. cards. But you can keep the original one in there as right. well as the new stuff. Cool. Next up, we've got the final releases for Ashes. Uh, these are two more expansion decks, the Grave King and the Protector of Argea. Um, and this is, brings the game to a conclusion, as they are saying. So um, to celebrate all the Ashes action that they've brought to our uh, tables, they've organized the one last No Holds Bar tournament in Dallas, Texas, in association with Common Ground Games. And they are going to be... Uh, that's going to be taking place Saturday, June 22nd, from noon to 6 p.m. And there will be prizes and so forth. Uh, there will be neoprene playmats with all new Phoenix-born card artwork, things like that. So there you go. As far as a release date, let me see. I don't think I have one here. But you can definitely check out the uh, Plaid Hat Games website for more information so on that. So now that Ashes is done, are we all going to fall down now? Ashes. To ashes. Ashes. We all fall down. This is horrible. Dad jokes galore today. <laughs> Next up, Hasbro is Hasbro. making that money. Okay, so Hasbro revenue is up according to their uh, reported financial result from a, a bit ago here. This is for the first quarter 2019. Net revenues for the first quarter increased 2% Ooh. to $732.5 million. Compared to 716.3 million in 2018, they are making that cash. The first quarter uh, revenues um, went up six percent. They are saying Hasbro's total gaming category, that includes, of course, Magic the Gathering and Monopoly, the two heavy hitters, uh, are counted in that, and they total 243 million for the first quarter, which is up 20 percent. Versus first quarter in 2018. I need to go get my umbrella. That is basically it. There's some more information here about how rich they are, but I think you get it. Hasbro is Hasbro's making doing it well. rain. And next up, one final piece of news here about Kickstarter. And you can oh. see this on Kickstarter. If you go to their website, they just hit $1 billion and counting, of course, <laughs> pledged to games on Kickstarter since launching in 20. To in, uh, in 2009 to just board games just board games wow pledge to well games i think that might include video, video games, games. Hmm. um and of course it's grown steadily and that is very much helped by things like exploding kittens shovel knight which was a video game yeah. uh things like that so they are combining that because they don't they don't give you board games on the one thing's for true one thing is for true nerds got money uh, the collective nerds, sure. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Backers have uh, funded nearly 17,000 games projects, bringing to life uh, tons of different creators' visions mm -hmm. in both, of course, video games and board games and probably other things I'm not thinking of. 
Uh, and they say, as we've grown, we've continued to look for ways to support our creator community and get our backers the latest info, whether it's through the weekly emails, projects we love, or our creator-focused podcast. We want to give our more than 3.2 million games backers the latest from the bleeding edge of independent games projects. So there you go. Kickstarter also making that moolah cash. And that brings us to the end of our news. Chad wants us to mention the yes. Scythe modular board. It's coming May 29th. All right. That's coming May 29th. Go there check go. out Stone My for that and the video game news. We mentioned it, Chad. There you go. More coffee for you. Yes, thank you. And some more yes, news fun. from our contributors. Here we go. Hello, fellow gamers. So this is a spoiler free zone here. I mean, we've had a lot of really crazy geeky stuff come up like Endgame and everything that happened in there with doing other things and then happening and as well as Game of Thrones and the spoilers have just been all over the internet about then happened and you know, this is just going to be all about board games. You don't have to worry about anything else. Crap. Featured this week, we have Bloodborne by Cool Mini or Not Games. This is for one to four console players looking to bring all the lovely little horrors from Bloodborne right to their table. In this campaign style game that lasts for about 60 to 90 minutes while players cooperatively search the city, picking fights with random monsters minding their own business, using deck building and a card driven combat system. Pledges for this game are $100. Now, if you're still considering vanquishing monsters in the night, but maybe looking for something a little more family friendly than Kingswood by 25th Century Games would be a better fit for you as one to five introvert adventurers travel around town trying to avoid everyone they see all while trying to collect sets of items to vanquish the scourge within the forest for 14 to 30 minutes in this family worker placement game that starts with a base cost of only $25. So if playing an introvert just isn't your style then Rusty Industry by Yodeling Ogre Games will bring you back to the table as three to four economic geniuses with a bit of charisma hit the market, selling and bartering for the best deals on some ancient real estate for 60 to 90 minutes. This game also boasts that it can be taught in only five minutes, putting this as one of the very few easy to learn economic engine building games that won't break the bank for $38. Finally, we have a very punny little game called Complexity by Big Kid Games, which will put your strategic tiling to the test as one to four astrogeophysicists create the perfect environment for several different displaced alien species, working on creating the most growth within their city for about 45 minutes as players will be creating complexes and using species abilities to win over those ambassadors. Now this game costs $39 and will certainly squash that need to play some city. Thanks for joining me today, guys. If you want to hear more about any of the Kickstarters that you saw here today, then make sure to join me live on Fridays at noon Mountain Time as we talk about all of these in depth and if we would back them or not. It's going to be me, Dr. Glory Hogg, and this other crazy guy named Greg Dixon. So I hope to see you guys all there, and I hope you guys have a awesome time figuring out all those spoilers. <laughs> Welcome back to the month of Lock and Load Publishing, and today we're going to hit their module in their tactical system, Day of Heroes. This game was inspired by the Battle of Mogadishu, Operation Gothic Serpent, which happened October 3rd and 4th of 1993, and they made a movie of it, Black Hawk Down. Remember? So the Americans with Pakistan and Malaysia sent in Delta Force and the Rangers. I mean, these guys take care of business. And, you know, how well armed can these Somali guys be? So one hour you're supposed to get out? Well, after two days, 100 casualties and two Black Hawks down, two helicopters, uh, someone's gonna have to answer to this. This game comes with a four page rule book, though you have to have read the core rule book in general. Now you're probably saying the other rule book, yeah, but if you read that rule book, that one rule book to rule them all, you can play all these games. They probably have four page rule books themselves. This game comes with two sheets of counters, Somalis 
VIPs that are going to be missions where you're supposed to save very important people. There are mobs and roadblocks. Here are the Somali leaders. You get those guys, you put a big herd on them. Here we see the Rangers, Delta Force, and a couple of Delta Force snipers. Here the Somalis have recoilless rifles, mortars, and heavy machine guns, while the Americans have their copters, some tanks, and the Blackhawk. The Somalis have a secret weapon called CAT. CAT is an amphetamine. It's a plant. They chew it, it ups their attack, but it reduces their movement. Well, their attack, because they're all speeded up, they want to kill someone, but they're too stupid and stoned because where are they? Where are they? You get an 11 by 22 inch map, and if you look, there are no hexes, they're squares. This is what the map looks in action. See, they're all snug as a bug in a rug in their respective squares. But, but I don't want it to be snug as a bug in a rug. I want a bear map. Well, little Nebelwerfer, they have just that. It's called X maps, where you can fit twice to three times the amount of chits in each square. This is the original map that comes with the game, which is perfectly fine. And this is the Biggie Wiggy map, which is amazing. This is a standalone game in their tactical series and comes with everything you need to play. Day of Heroes is a tactical level game in the modern era, designed by Jeff Lewis, published by Lock and Load Publishing. Thank you for watching, and if you want to know more about war games, please check out my channel, No Enemies Here. Hey folks, welcome back to another segment of Gamer Stereotypes. As you can see behind me, today's Gamer Stereotype is Time Bandits. Now, what do we mean by Time Bandits? Time Someone Bandits... Steals time. Yes, because they're bandits of time. They, they, they burglarize... Burglar, yes. The, the time stream. Yeah. Uh. Kinda, or at least it feels that They're way. Like jump in a DeLorean and abuse time space and its continuum, and then laugh about it. And they're like, "Oh, where we're going? We don't need sensical <laughs> statements." I'll be quiet. Yes. <clears throat> All right. That's true. No, time bandits are those people that, when you're playing the game, they don't seem to be worried that the game is taking longer than it really should, and the reason it's taking longer than they really should. Mm -hmm is because they're on their phones. Oh. They're talking to people that are coming by and saying hi and hi. all this other kind of stuff. And uh, they are uh, going up to, as our, as our studio mate Chris said, they're, they're maybe getting up and playing Pokemon Go. They actually <laughs> leave the table to go catch a Pokemon that's in the corner of the store hey, over man, there. You gotta catch them all. Yeah, right? This is a time bandit. These people are not concerned. It's not that they're thinking about the game. It's not that they're so involved and they don't know what to do, and so they're, they're, they're paralyzed by too much analysis. That's not it. It's like they're almost aloof, mm -hmm. and they're not paying attention to the game. They, I mean, yeah, I'm having fun, but there's so many other things. I'm a busy person, you know, this kind of stuff. Time bandits. It's about sort of taking something seriously, I think, is partly what it is also. I guess so. It's um, like this is just... This isn't what we're doing right now. This yeah. is just one of the things going on right now. Right. It's like putting on the TV. There's no prize of prioritization. Pri right. Prioritization. You put on the TV, and if like you want to go get a drink, you just get up and go get it. Whatever. You like ignore that thing for a mm -hmm. for a few mm -hmm. seconds. Except when you walk away from the TV, nobody else is sitting there waiting on you. you yes. Know? Yeah. Um, I actually do have a family member who is a time bandit around the television. Really? Where, like, watching a movie over at their place, yeah. that's two hours, takes three and a half. Because they, they pause, pause and do things <laughs> and go and pause and do things, so it's not a good place to watch oh, movies. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, when, I, when you said time bandits originally, I thought you were talking, because Sam just told me what the topic was, and I thought you were talking about those people who come up to you with a game and go, hey, y'all want to try this? It's really fun. It's very simple to learn. Right. And it's 30 minutes. And that is not one lie. That's probably several lies. <laughs> it's probably not as simple as they're saying. And it's definitely not 30 minutes. If, it, if they're saying 30, it's probably 90 minutes. Believe that. <laughs> Believe that. Uh, 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 Slivers here says the real monsters are people at the table who do not get up to catch a rare Pokemon. See, that guy. 
Okay, is probably one of the guys in Chris's old game group that used to drive oh, Chris up the snap. wall. Hi. Thanks for <laughs> that's watching. That's probably what it is. We'll tell Chris you said hello. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Sliver says hello. Board Game Fangirl says, I have never gamed with people who text during gaming. That's very lucky. That is incredibly lucky. Wait, does rare. she like maybe take all their phones away though? Uh, I don't know. Do you? Like put them in a basket when Some you walk in the house? Some people do that though. Yeah. If, you have a, if you have a game night and you know there's a basket by the door and you deposit your phone there and you pick it up on your way out. A phone. Anyone's phone on the way True. out. True. Like you bring two phones. You bring your old flip phone and put and that in there. And take an have iPhone your... home. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man. Game night. It's a swap meet, right? Yeah, you just you take away a better phone. Um, yeah, that's that's. Uh, I know people who, or I've heard of people who do that, deposit the phone. I mean, I need my phone. How am I supposed to look up strategy articles while I'm playing? But that's not a bad idea. It's, a lot of people do it with food. Don't bring the food to the table. Maybe don't bring your phone to the table. You know. But I think at the end of the day, restricting people who are Accustomed to that kind of behavior is sort of like putting a Band-Aid on a gash, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, you, those people need to become aware of if you are bending time at the table, if you are really bringing the group down with your behavior. I don't mind, and I've done it plenty of times, grabbed the phone and done something, but I'm trying to be aware of what's going on. Yeah. If it's my turn, I need to be on top of it, you know? Yeah. I don't want... Again, it's it's about a game is going to deliver X amount of fun over X amount of minutes. If you double that number of minutes, that fun is diluted. Sometimes time bands can actually happen inside of a game, too. It's not always extraneous things that are going oh, on. Oh, sure. Sometimes a time bandit will, will actually start talking about things with the group. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with this, but if you do it too much... It unnecessarily prolongs the game. Right. And then people are going to think back to that game and say, you know, I really didn't like that because it took so long to play. But it's actually Jim's fault. It's Shut up, not, Jim. It's not the no game's one fault cares about point. Captain America the First Avenger. That was like eight years ago. <laughs> Catch up, man. I will say this, though. I don't think there's any problem. I think, you know, I, there, there's nothing wrong with. Depositing phones in a, in a basket at the beginning of a game, of a game of night. I don't have a problem with that. However, I will say that I have a lot of people that I try to keep in contact with as mm-hmm. much as I can. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I need to have my phone. If you need to do a thing, you got to do a thing. Right. It's more like lackadaisical sort of doing other things that yeah. are also fun. Right. It's a lack of focus. It really is. It like, is. we can't just play this game right now. This is not our source of entertainment. These three, four things are our source yeah. of entertainment. Yeah. So, there you go. That is correct. Time. Don't be a time bandit. Cut it out. All right, let's check out some more segments. Hi, everybody. I'm Jana, and today I want to talk about... Firefly the game. This game has been out for quite a while. It was in my house for quite a while before I played it. And that's why I feel like it deserves a bit of a review. Because I had very bad feelings about this game. It's a board game based off of a show. A show I love, but I mean how good could a game be based off of a show? I assumed it would be something along the lines of Monopoly with the theme smeared all over it, but I was wrong. I was so wrong. It wasn't like any games I had played before, and I was amazed at how well they had captured this this show that I love. All the characters are in the game and you have your own ship to control and you get to choose what what jobs you want to do and then the the Reavers, there's Reavers in this game and the Alliance and and all, all of them. They're all in here. A few things that you should know if you ever decide to play this game. Number one, you will need a huge table. And you're going to need time. I would say on in on average our games run about three hours. I'm curious what they claim. Two hours. <laughs> if you're not familiar with the story or even enjoyed it, then you might not enjoy playing this game because it does seem ruthlessly mean and um, kind of punishing. 
My cheap medic is gone. Gosh, that was going so well. Do that. But if you did enjoy this story, like all of it's worth it because there's so many fun, um, <clears throat> wacky things that they add into the game that really r remind you like why you love the story so much and you expect the the punishing to be harsh because you know that the reavers eat people and you know that the alliance is cruel and and soulless so yeah, yeah like you wouldn't want it to be any less than what it is there are so many board games out on the market today that are about space travel and, and are a sandboxy type of game and and so this might not be the space board game for you but if you're a Firefly fan this is definitely the space game for you. Have you ever judged a game before you played it and realized you were totally wrong? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast and I hope you guys have a great day. This is Roy Canny, and this is Five, where I take a look at my top five things in a specific game. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at Magic Cards in Wiz War. Wiz War is a game that came out before Magic the Gathering kind of helped inspire it a little bit, but it's this crazy dueling wizards trying to grab treasures in a maze game. So my number five is Heave Ho. So this card is kind of crazy because it's just that whole thing of like, trying to just, I just need to move a little bit further to get this treasure to my home base and you try to like throw it on your home base or you're throwing some sort of object at an enemy wizard to try to do damage to him. I just think it's a lot of silly fun and can set up interesting combos. Then what would a wizard game be without counter type spells? Absorb spell is my number four. So this cancels the target spell um, as it's being cast and then you get to take that spell and put it into your hand so you can cast it back at your opponents. Like, ha, you thought you were gonna play that? Now I'm gonna play it. It's really cool. Um, and then what would Wiz War be without creating walls? So you're running around this maze, there's all these different wizards. You can create walls to like block your opponent from either coming to your area of the board or to like trap them in a corner. I just like every time I play this game, throwing up walls and destroying walls all over the place is a huge part of the game. So I love the create wall spell. And then there's a whole bunch of different creatures you can summon and my number two is summon Minotaur. I really enjoy a lot of these different creatures you can bring out, but the Minotaur is kind of crazy because basically you put him out and then um, whenever he anybody enters his line of sight, he just charges them and tries to do four damage to them. Um, it's just really funny to have like a Minotaur running around this maze and it's very thematic for the game itself. And then my number one is Brainstone. This game you're trying to like cycle out your cards and get energy cards so you can move further and Brainstone allows you to draw two extra cards and ups your hand size. So it's really cool to be able to have more options and more spells to be able to play. So Brainstone is my number one spell in Wiz War just cause you get to have more spells in general when you have it. Awesome, well thanks for joining me for five and I'll see you on the next one. Turn. Ooh. I'm ready. I'm Ellen. Welcome to We Game Together. We are talking about another Steffenfeld game. It's Steffenfeld kind of month for us. Yeah, we're like on a binge right now. Some played a lot of Steffenfelds. Yeah. Played what four new Steffenfelds yeah. this month? Because I told him that I haven't played that many, and also he goes and buys a bunch. So oh, I can't. I, got good deals I can't. On them. I can't say. You know what? I kind of want to try this game because it will show up at our doorstep. Well, don't show interest in the game then. Okay, I'll try to never <laughs> show interest in the game again. Um, so we're talking about Bora Bora, and I love number three. Uh, it's his <sighs> castles, Carpe Diem, Bora Bora, number three. He loves this one. I don't know why I don't love it. I do. So the one thing I was really trying to figure out how I could articulate why I don't like it. One thing is I'm very like visual, and I feel like there's so much going on in this board. It is one of the least intuitive sure. stuff in film games that I've played yet, I think. Because usually uh, when you I go guess. somewhere, there's a picture and you're like, oh, I, I know what to do with that. This one is, is just like, here's another, like... It's colorful. Thingy. It's it's actually one of the better looking of the stuff in films, I think. Just in general, it's got a lot sure, of color. Sure, I mean, it's still stuff in films with Alea and <laughs> Rabbit's Burger. Boards. So like, flimsy boards. It wood does have wood components. It. That's good. But yeah, <laughs> lacking. Yeah. But who cares? It's Steffenfeld. I don't care. Right, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I had fun playing it. It's not that I didn't have fun. I just didn't love it. It gets better for me 
you know, every time there's there's a lot more to explore that we haven't yet. And I'm looking forward to playing it again just to figure out more things that you can do. You can specialize in certain aspects. You get bonus points when you complete complete chunks of like different things you can do. Right. That I didn't like grasp until I think I'm figuring out why I didn't like it. I didn't really figure out that, yeah, when you complete chunks of the board, you get bonus things. It's not much more difficult necessarily than any others, but there are more like options, I guess, that... Yeah. You can do and There's more you happening. have to, you do want to definitely focus on things to get some of those bonus points. Good yeah. game. Good game. It's Number a good game. three, I, I would say. I Somewhere like, around the three range. Is there for an Stephen echo Feld. in this room? <laughs> <laughs> um the one thing I really like about it is that you use like shells to buy things. I just think that is so cute. So like every time I was like, I'll take one shell, please. <laughs> shell i'll take two i'll take shells. a shell to buy that shell necklace <laughs> i really like that it is it is it is fine it's a game again it's a game that's good <laughs> top three material <laughs> you know and i love carpe diem and castles of burgundy and those are like oogly and yes. this is definitely prettier i just yeah. i don't know i don't know all right Try guys it out. <laughs> picture of the day see you next time <laughs> bye Howdy folks, welcome to By the Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from The Family Showdown. This week we are continuing my Through the Year series where we look at the most popular game on Board Game Geek by year. We started with 1970, this week we're looking at 1973. Taking a look at the list of the top five games from 1973, we see that the number one game is Hare and Tortoise. Hare and Tortoise is currently ranked 1199 on Board Game Geek. In this game, it's a racing game. You're spending carrots to move forward on a board. You move backwards, forward, gain carrots, lose carrots, spin carrots. It's a mathematical craziness. Heron Tortoise won the very first Spiel des Jahres Award in 1979. I'm not sure why it won in 1979. It came out in 1973, but it won the first award. And it has been reprinted numerous times by numerous companies in numerous languages, and it is still available today. Let's take a look at the rating. We see with just under 4,000 votes, Hare and Tortoise has an average rating of 6.6. .6. Although this is a very simple game to learn, its crazy mathiness gives it a weight of 1.94 out of 5. So if you're looking for a mathematical problem disguised as a board game, you might want to check out Hare and Tortoise. See you next time. be cracking open a box it's gonna be a surprise for you but not us because it's not, not in because a, it's, it's not, not in a cardboard box, a box. Yeah. only tom gets those to his house so we can't do that but we do have mm, oh this, it's big this little thing right here it says heroes of land air and sea pestilence a seventh player, seventh expan player expansion featuring two additional factions the bird bird folk. I was gonna say bride folk. I was like, that's kind of strange. The bird but folk. Bird folk. And the mer folk. And the mer folk. Are we just doing that? Can you just put folk? I know mer folk. I've definitely heard bird folk. Fishies and birdies. We can just do that with whatever. The horse folk. Sure. They're called centaurs though. No, nah, I do what I want. Something uh. folk. <laughs> what? Stone folk. Stone folk. That's like you know big uh, golems. This is a huge box. We should open it. Look at that thing. I'm this... going to paint it. While you open it, I'll paint it. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's going to work. Spray can. Ooh. Oh, that... oh, my goodness. I was watching somebody else, somebody's unboxing of something the other day. Uh -huh. Clearly, he was rushing. He wasn't being very careful. He, he opens it up. He did this. He did that. Then he gets to one of those packs of little cards. That are, that are shrink wrapped together, but they're real thick. It's like a long, yes. thick block. Right. And he went, and in doing that, they went, poof, and he bent one so disgustingly. I did that same thing. I was like, <laughs> ah! He destroyed, like, he bent a card completely. Really? Because he just went, poof. 
instead of being careful about it. You know, you can't rush with these things, people. Take your time, man. When it comes to unboxing, be a time bandit. There you go. Here we go. I'll read this real quick. Wow, there's like plastic mm -hmm. standees in here. I guess it's for the mm -hmm. bird folk. Mm-hmm. 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 Because these things are in here, and they're doing all... Mm -hmm. Got it. That. You ain't got nothing. Man, I read that. I'm a speed reader. This is uh, smaller ones. There are bird folk in there and merfolk. I know Mercenaries, that. Mercenaries, you want to open that? The Sunken City. Mercenaries expansion pack number three. There's like a... This was like... Just in... Wait, that what? was in there like loose? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of loosely wrapped around all this other, st other stuff, so... Open you it. have Treants. Tree it's Mercenary ants. mini expansion. Ballista. Mm. Siege Engines mini expansion. Nomads. Um... Demon Lord. Ooh, calling it. Mine, mine, mine. Dun, 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 dun. Um, here we have the Underworld Max Souls. I have mm. no idea. Roy should really be over here doing this because he's like the he's the one that's like Roy is the one that knows what's going on. All right, so in this little over heels in the little Mercenaries expansion, I've got a little deck of cards that I'm gonna open like this and and then four. Little miniatures, pretty cool little minis. I got a Medusa, Medusa Oblongata, Medusa Oblongata. No, Colonel Ma Sanders, Ma you're Ma wrong. My mama said, if you look at the snakes, they turn you into stone. <laughs> My Ma mama said, Mama, Mama, Mama said, Mama's right. Medusa Oblongata, you're wrong. All right, so we've got the courtyard, um, and uh, then we have. Well, no, not the courtyard. This is just the courtyard. Different. different uh, oh, there's, there's elves. Yes. Here. Yes. Dwarves. Good. And so orcs. These are all just boards that uh, have already come in the game. I'm assuming these are going to be for expansions, right? I think they're like redos of a lot of. Redos. 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 Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's what I mean. a lot of content. Lion on those. King, undead. Wait, Lion King. Lion Ken. Sorry. Oh, I heard Lion King. Yeah, it's like kind of the like that. Circle of life. They should have said lion folk. That would have been better. Lion folk. What's up? They're changing the terminology. Lizard folk. Lizard folk. D goblin folk. No, no, that, that doesn't work. Why not? That's that's that should be what um, it is. So here's some more. St Man, there's a lot of stuff in here. There possibly be more things in there. Here. All here right. Go. I got this. I'll read this real quick. Um, got it. Const construct assembly guides. And it's a good thing we don't have a segment ourselves after this because this table is about to be this. murderized. More of this. And this is all the stuff you got to put together, all of the different things. Now, I know Roy's like 3D printed all of this stuff, so already. <laughs> so. He's like, eh, yeah, yeah, kind of. That's what he's Two doing right people. now. people. You got, oh, this is the actual expansion, the new guys, the bird folk and, and the mer folk. And the donkey folk. Yeah, them too. So there's that. And then we, ooh, what is this? Oh, it's transparency. What is that? That's pretty. Roy, what is this? Help, help. What is this for? It goes on the board for the Merco. Oh. Because it's, so they're in the water. That is adorableness. And then here's another boardy thingy. The floating continent. The Let me see. floating Let me continent. Let me see and what here this cardboard is. At the bottom, is, you have is like. the different merfolk or people's. Ooh, a cloud so city. We'll look at some of this stuff here real quick. Ooh. Tray pretty. Tray pretty? Very. It means very. Oh, in that French. means very? Yeah. Uncultured swine. Hey, the man. French folk. So here here are some of the uh, little miniatures that come in there. I'm not going to take them oh, all out. I like out. those colors. Uh, Is yeah. every faction a different color in this game, Mr. Yes. Canada? Yes? Yes, yes. That's pretty. And they're all pastel colors too, aren't they? They're yeah. all candy? Dusty He's, candy? Yeah, pretty much. So that's the different uh, models so that are in here billion as well. things in this box. Yes, there is a lot of stuff. So this is a huge expansion. Um, pretty cool. So that is your surprise unboxing, Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. Pestilence! Ew. That's Arr. disgusting. <laughs> we got one more segment or chunk of segments for you. And then we'll come on back to say g -g 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 goodbye. Cool. Here we go. What birthday present would you give to Board Gamer? Well, that's easy, right? Board game. But which one? 
Today, I'll share you a very special board game that I've received. Coming up. Hi, Stella from Impul University. Hope your week's been well. My partner, also the other half of Impul University, gave me the best board game ever on my last birthday. Before I get into it, have you heard of Dominion? That card building game with a lot of pretty much standalone expansions? Dominion is one of my favorite games. I think I have almost all of the expansions. Now, I bet you don't have this one. Dominion Stella, ta-da! Okay, this is definitely just for our personal use only, which I'm still going to show you. Tarrant designed all the photos and all the actions on the cards according to the story of the photos one by one. Took photos secretly from our photos collection, used some inside jokes, work on this for eight months secretly behind my back. All of the set in the game were made, then sent to professional printers, and this looks pretty much like other Dominion cards. He bought an empty Dominion box secondhand as well. He did admit that he the actions that were probably not well balanced. I have never cried receiving a present before, but this one is different. I was speechless and very happy. It's a very very special present for me and I just want to share it with you today. Have you received something like this? I saw someone propose with Magic the Gathering cards. Was this you? Please let me know what personalized board game that you have received or given. Well, thanks for watching. If you enjoy my segment, please consider checking Nipple University out on YouTube. On our channel, we do a lot of overview, how to play, play through, review and flow. See you next time. Hello and welcome to Tantrum House Studio 3. We are here talking about tiny towns, what we love, what we hated, who won and how. Tiny Towns is from AEG and it's a one to six player pattern building game. Everyone gets a grid that they will on each turn select one resource to add to their building, uh, their town, and then configure buildings with those pieces. Uh, it's, it has a very simple rule set, which is a great thing, but there's a lot of strategy and thinking in where you put those resources to build your buildings in your town. Yeah, so something that I really loved about this game is you are managing that grid. You're trying to put those things in the right order so you can build spots um, with specific buildings. If you don't get that, you're working yourself into a corner. Yeah, I really love the variability. The buildings have different cards, so each game they can have different powers. And then the players also have unique monuments that they're trying to build. I love that you've got the simultaneous stuff going on, and I hate the fact that when you get to the end of the game, that ends because as soon as you fill up your board, you're out of the game, you're getting the negative points for whatever gets removed, and everybody else gets the time, the chance to fine-tune their stuff and finish it out. I actually really like that part. I just hate the fact that I never win. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Yeah, he's sad. I mean, we gotta take care of this wizard. He keeps blocking our path every which way we go. We gotta get rid of him, or we need to brew a real proper. I know, because we're trying to straight murder him. He keeps getting our way, and I'm like, no oh, more. Okay, so I want yeah, this cauldron so. quest to go well. Yeah, okay? this cauldron's so, gotta go well. All right, so what are we gonna get in this cauldron, though? Yeah, we we, you know, we don't. Most most witches start with the base of water. We don't, obviously. We start with the base of Lacroix right. because, as you know, you don't drink Lacroix, you, you experience, experience it. it exactly. Nice. We're gonna throw in some newt leg. Some newt okay. leg. Well, here. hold on, hold on. I want to make sure it's. Cake. Cage free new leg. It's cage free. No, I only buy the cage free stuff. You know that. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. This one, you don't I don't want to have to Boom. go back to the newts. Boom. Yes, okay. exactly. No, you gotta treat them humanely before you right. cut their legs. Right. So exactly. I think we should add some organic uh, rat wart extract. Wait, question. We we are still mur like murdering guy with all this, right? Oh yeah. I know he's gonna die completely. But we want to okay. make sure it's humane. It's just like, starting to sound really yummy, is all. No, I know. I know. I, I want. I, I, I want a little bite. It's gonna nourish my spirit while totally. it ravages my body. <laughs> <laughs> This is Cauldron Quest. Cauldron Quest is a cooperative kids game where you are all trying to get these three proper ingredients all the way down to the bottom. On these, on the other side, there are the different ingredients. On your turn, you roll these two dice. Depending on what comes up, you get to do a couple different things. You get to move that ingredient bottle down how many numbers are there. But unfortunately, there's a wizard around. The wizard doesn't like you for some reason. If the wizard ever moves past one of your potion bottles or lands on it, it goes all the way back up the top. Also, the wizard can bring out different animals like owls 
bottle to block your path. A pill bottle can't go past this path. Oh no! But if you roll a pill bottle and one of these lightning bolts, you get to roll these three die. And depending on what comes up, you get to do a couple different things. One thing you can do is swamp one. Or you can reveal one. Be like, oh cool, we do need this one. This one, ah, we don't need this. Screw this one. Who cares? If you get all three proper ingredients down to the bottom here, you win. If the wizard blocks all six paths, you lose. So that was Cauldron Quest. I love that there is a game that is aimed at children that is still like, hey, let's work together to, to solve this puzzle to accomplish this task because that's something that you can carry over in your daily life. Totally. Like kids can learn like problem solving and as a team. And that's all for us folks. We are the Brothers Murph. You can join us at the Brothers Murph right here on YouTube. If you like what we do, feel free to give us a subscription. Uh, we're trying to hit 10,000 subscribers by August. Ah! So help us get there by subscribing today. Uh, and just uh, in the meantime, well, I guess we'll see you at the thrift store. We'll see you there. Hello guys, it's Cardboard Rhino, and today I want to show you a really good dice drafting Euro game set in a beautiful city in Portugal. It's Coimbra. The game takes place during the Age of Discovery in a wealthy and thriving Portugal, and Coimbra is the cultural center of the country. Players are heads of the oldest houses, trying to get influence and prestige. Here you have the city locations, the pilgrim map, the influence tracks, and the voyage cards. In your player board you have your guards and your money, and it shows as well the sequence of the phases in each round, as well as the spots for your character cards which activate in specific phases. In the beginning of each round, the dice are rolled and players in player order choose one, use this castle thingy of their color, and place it in a city location. The number on each die represents the bribe they're willing to pay to get some synergies going. So the player with the highest one in each row gets to be the first to collect a character card in that row, and the other players do the same in bribe order. All the cards available are unique for each round, and they give you lots of different good stuff. The dice drafting mechanic also affects the influence income each player gets in the round. The color of the dice activates the income of the same colored influence track and the player gets either guards, coins, steps in the pilgrim map or direct victory points. The top part of the castle gives you some favor tiles without any cost and you choose them in ascending order. The game ends after four rounds and the player with the most points wins. There's many different ways to get points from the voyages you have invested in, from the diplomas some of your characters have, from scoring high in the influence tracks, and game bonuses, and so on. At a glance, the game looks like it follows a very standard recipe for success, like offering many different ways to get VPs, a set collection, and some more player interaction with the bidding. And it is actually all done very well, and it's very robust but I think the dice drafting mechanic is the heart of the game, it's innovative and it offers a very refreshing feel to it. The dice are utilized in various ways and this impacts many different aspects of the decision making. You will have to try to make the best out of every role, you'll try to plan ahead and maybe sometimes you'll try to push your opponents out of their bribing budget and anticipate their moves. I feel that Coimbra is a good and sort of like a safe choice to bring to your game night. It's very easy to understand, there's many paths to victory, and it combines mechanics that appeal to a big spectrum of gamers. Plus, the art is beautiful and colorful, so Rhino will say yes to Coimbra, I'm up for playing it anytime. All right, everybody, and that's going to do it for us on this Board Game Breakfast Live. Thanks for yeah, joining yeah. us, of course. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with more live content. In the morning, we'll be doing a live playthrough of a game called Unrivaled. Make sure you check that out, a party game. And then in the afternoon, Mr. Vass will be back, so we're going to be doing a back talk, back talk discussion as well there. But, of course, you'll have more videos coming from us that are not live in the afternoon mm -hmm. and to carry you through uh, the weekend as well. So that's it for us. Again, my name is Z Garcia. Sam Healy. That's Roy Canaday over there. Yeah. Have a great day. We'll see you later. See you on the flip side, folks. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. 
cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.